The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. The next presenter is Dr. Mark Green, and uh, he is presenting on FRP research. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dylan. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some rational design for FRP strength in concrete structures. And I want to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Luke Bisbee, from the University of Edinburgh. So we started this work when I was on sabbatical leave there uh, last year. So I'm going to give a bit of an outline, talk a little bit about uh, FRP, fiber reinforced polymers and high temperatures, talk a little bit about how currently fire provisions are handled in the ACI 440 recommendations, what we're suggesting for modifications, uh, and one of those relates to loading during the fire, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then in terms of a rational approach, talk about thermal modeling and structural modeling and, and a design example to do. So the first, I just want to set the context of what I'm talking about in terms of fiber reinforced polymers is that we have these high strength fibers, typically carbon fibers, glass fibers, et cetera, in a polymer matrix uh, material, and these are just show some examples, different uh, material. I'm talking about strengthening materials, so typically sheets as shown here, uh, or plates. Uh, and the other products here you see, uh, you see uh, some structural shapes even, and uh, reinforcing bars as well. But uh, for today's presentation, I'm focusing on uh, repair materials. So. In terms of the concerns for FRP in the fire, basically, well, as my wife says, well, it's plastic, it burns, so it's not going to work very well in the fire, but uh, uh, there are some things. Certainly, we do lose strength and stiffness as we get to certain temperatures, uh, but certainly the, the fibers that are in do not lose the strength and stiffness anywhere uh, near the same rate as the polymer itself. But we do have to worry about the loss of bond or interaction with the concrete. And of course, we have to worry about uh, smoke generation and flame spread uh, in terms of protecting the FRP from that. So to sort of allow for proper design in a fire, these are some of the key recommendations that are currently in the for 440 guidelines for repair of concrete structures in terms of dealing with uh, fire situations. So one of the things that's currently said is that uh, you can't use any of the strength of the FRP unless you can say that it stays below a certain critical temperature, which is basically taken as the lowest glass transition temperature of any component of the system that you're using. And the glass transition temperature is a temperature for these uh, materials that are applied at room temperature. It's typically between about 60 to 80 uh, degrees centigrade, so in the or about a little over 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit at the low end and going up to about 140 degrees at the higher end in terms of, uh, in terms of Fahrenheit. Uh, and so that's where at that glass transition temperature then we're having the uh, basically changing from being very glassy state to becoming sort of rubbery uh, in, and that's sort of the change in the transition at that point. Uh, the other thing is that the loading condition that is currently is sort of matched up with the E1, ASTM E119 that's uh, one 
a full dead load and a full live load, and uh, that you can improve the performance by using insulating uh, methods, et cetera. And then there's a reference to the, the 216R guide, uh, although that's uh, not been updated uh, recently, that guide. But it still has uh, useful information. Uh, so some of the changes that we're talking about, we moved away a little bit from the discussion about the critical temperature before and emphasize that you have to demonstrate the FRP can remain effective if you're going to take, uh, use it at all in the fire endurance. Uh, the other sort of big departure that we're sort of suggesting is to go along with the, uh, in in changing the loads to be consistent with those of uh, of um, of the ASC. So the difference is basically that we have an increased dead load combination, but a lower live load combination. And uh, and then if you want to use any of the FRP contribution, you have to show that uh, effectiveness through testing. Uh, but once again, it sort of suggests, uh, mentions about this lowest TG. So it kind of comes back a little bit to what was in the previous uh, guidelines. So some of the reasons for these new load factors, uh, basically it's that having the full live load present during a fire is not uh, a reasonable expectation. And so, for example, the in ASC that uh, with the using half of the dead load, that's sort of less than a 5% probability of being exceeded in a given year. And, so, and basically the average live load that we expect in a building is more like a, a quarter of the live load rather than half of the live load. So, so in most circumstances, you're talking about having about quarter of the loads. We're saying in fire design for about half of them. Uh, now, that, the difference, too, is if you have a, a storage load or something like that that you know is going to be present, then you have to use the full live load in those cases. So that's also another point. But here I've just sort of plotted up a uh, comparison of these loading conditions just to see what the effect is. And so what I have is the sort of the, the load in fire, and I've just arbitrarily no normalized these so that it's uh, one for the dead load. And just to see what happens as you increase the live to dead load ratio. So I, I went up here to a factor of two for just purposes. And I plotted a couple of points here. One, this is where we have a live to dead load ratio of about 0.4. And this is a case where you would have an eight inch slab with about uh, 50 pounds per square inch. Or <laughs> square inch. That would be a heavy load per square foot um, uh, on, on that. And so that's a sort of reasonable office loading uh, capacity. And then we're, we're up here where we have uh, double that live load uh, in this region. So these are sort of reasonable ranges. There's not a huge difference in terms of the effects. You'll note that the current provisions compared to the new recommendation are unconservative at the low levels where you have low specified, so if you have uh, a high dead load um, ratio or very low live loads on your structure. So if you're dominated by the dead load, that, that could be unconservative. I know in our Canadian code we've increased the, uh, the factor for when you just have dead load cases in general. Um, so in terms of uh, doing the uh, fire endurance uh, to do the analysis. So the first things that you need to do is to find the temperatures in the member. And there are a number of ways to do that. And we're recommending to use, for example, some guidance in the ACI 216. And then look at reductions in material strengths. And then use those reductions to then calculate uh, the member strengths. And others have talked about using finite element codes, et cetera, to do this. but you. Uh, I'm going to give some examples just using uh, basic plane sections analysis to do that. This is sort of just a, a sketch of a philosophy for fire safety with uh, the increase uh, in strength and what this represents. And 
uh, have to acknowledge the editors, Concrete International, for this uh, graphic. Uh, it was their suggestion that we develop it. Uh, basically, it represents a uh, repaired concrete structure. Uh, you start out with a service load and initial strength. Then you repair it at some time. You increase the strength. And generally, assuming that you're increasing that strength because you have an increased service load, and then you have the fire that happens and you lose your strength over time. And this graphic is representative of if you had an insulated system and you would lose that gradually or you had a, a fair bit of concrete cover. Uh, this is a, another possibility if you had strengthening uh, that, uh, and you did nothing, no fire protection, you'd lose that strengthening very early and then you could have a much shorter fire endurance in, in this case. Uh, so this is sort of a general overview or a concept of for FRP uh, repaired concrete structures and fire endurance and sort of look at, well, it's sort of a trade-off between the amount of strengthening that you might provide and then the fire resistance that you need. And, and if you don't need a lot of strengthening and you don't need a lot of fire resistance, you probably don't have to do very much simply worrying about flame spread is, should be adequate. However, uh, you move up if you need more strengthening and or more fire endurance, then you're going to need some insulation outside of the concrete member, not so much to protect the FRP, but to protect the original reinforced concrete uh, structure. Uh, and, and we have pretty good, and the examples I'm doing are in these two ranges here. You see that fairly shortly. And then we could, if we applied a lot of insulation, try to protect the FRP itself. But that's only going to be necessary in, in more rare cases. So this is a design example that's out of the uh, 440 guideline. Uh, so this is a repair example. So we have, uh, this is a 24 foot long uh, concrete beam, so it's uh, 12 inches, 12 inches in breadth, and the overall height is 24 inches or two feet. And uh, then the other basic properties are there. We have three reinforcing bars internally, and then it's strengthened on the bottom and flexure with FRP. So in terms of the analysis approach and the assumptions, uh, what he did is first found the temperatures at key locations, and I basically just did this from the ACI 216. Uh, so this is a figure f that's in that guide after two hours, and this curve is for 900 degrees Fahrenheit, about 500 degrees Celsius. So after two hours, this is basically what we're at for the steel rebar temperature, and it also I, I'm using this uh, for information about the concrete or what concrete is effective as well. So then we can look at reductions in the material strengths, et cetera. And uh, we've done some work, and I put some references here, although I haven't given all the details, but we have some papers uh, about material tests of the FRP. And from the steel reinforcement, I just took it from uh, ACI 216. And uh, then in terms of the concrete compressive block, I used a Eurocode approach where I simply ignored anything above 500 degrees centigrade, about 900 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so these are the reductions. So this is the steel reduction here. So you can see uh, it loses about half of its strength in sort of this five to 600 uh, degree region. The FRP is losing its strength very early on. And so once it reaches much above 100 degrees, it's, it's lost easily half its strength at that point. Uh, and then I just did a, a plain sections analysis uh, and uh, ignored any concrete that was above 500 degrees. Uh, and that's sort of the Eurocode uh, isotherm approach. So here's a, the unstrengthened beam in this case. And this has a lot of fire resistance because it has two and a half inches of clear concrete cover of, well, cover to the center of the reinforcement. So it's got lots of uh, cover uh, so that uh, we can see that we have more than uh, three hours of fire resistance. And the live to dead load ratio here 
is about 1.2. And you see there's not much difference between these two uh, proposals in terms of the ways of calculating the required load capacity in a fire. Uh, so now we actually strengthen it and we see even in this case with the strengthening, and this is the strengthening in the example that's given, we still have adequate fire resistance. Uh, we lose our FRP contribution basically right away uh, because we're not providing any specific protection to the FRP other than you have to protect against flame spread. So you need some sort of coating to protect in that, that manner but not provide any specific insulation. Uh, but here then we would have more than three hours fire resistance. It's a little bit less than what we had in the original member but it's, uh, it's not bad. Uh, however, if we wanted to do more strengthening, and this is still well within the limits established within the 440 guidance, and here I'm saying I want to increase the strength by 50%, that's maybe at the higher end, but it's certainly within limits, then now we've taken something that had more than three hours fire endurance. According to the existing limits of uh, one plus one uh, for dead and live, it would probably have about a one and a half hour fire resistance compared to over three hours that we started with. Uh, and this is a very flat curve. We, we come down quite quickly to being close to this limit. Uh, the other thing is our live to dead load ratio here now is 2.7. And I, I would think if we were to have a situation like that, it's likely to be a storage load or something like that. So actually even in this uh, revision here, I might move this load up if it were a permanent load, and with that 1.2 in the dead, we might actually be talking about a fire re uh, resistance, in this case, of less than an hour uh, in a storage situation. So then the solution is to uh, provide some insulation, and these are some tests on using only here 15 millimeters, which is just over half an inch of uh, insulation. And so we see we have the steel temperatures. So after four hours fire endurance, the steel is at 400 degrees centigrade. And so use that to develop these curves. And you can see, well, we, the insulation does protect the FRP a little bit in the early stages. This is really back of the envelope type. I mean, I can, we can do more sophisticated and we'll do stuff when we write a paper. But it, anyway, just for illustration purposes, I just kind of straight lined it to here. Uh, where we have, a, that's about 30 minutes, where we get about uh, 100 degrees centigrade, about 200 Fahrenheit in the, uh, in the FRP itself. But we're well above the limit uh, for more than three hours, and we've done tests, to several tests, to show that that, that works well. Uh, so basically, uh, that we're looking at changing the uh, demand equation from the one plus one to 1 1.2 plus half of the live load, so practical ways of doing this. And it's very possible to get adequate fire endurance with FRP repaired concrete structures as long as you understand what you're doing and if necessary to provide some insulation to the structure. So uh, some acknowledgments of funding and uh, Liver Home Trust in the UK sponsored my visit there and NSERC, uh, our funding body in Canada, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.